everyone. Welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. And in today's video, we're going to be continuing Naruto The Last Senju. What if Tsunade adopted Naruto? Part 2. As always, if you are new to the channel or if you're a regular and you like what we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Where we last left off with our series, we've started with a young Naruto who in an alternate timeline was given to Tsunade to look after following the death of Minato along with his mother Kushina. Naruto in this story was raised outside of the Hidden Leaf Village, raised in one of the many small towns out in the Land of Fire. Because of this, the Hidden Leaf Village was able to move on past the Nine Tails attack. Because there was no Naruto, there was no one to direct all of their anger and fury. While there was a bit of sadness in a time of rebuilding, the history of the Nine Tails was treated as taboo, so to speak, something that wasn't spoken of much within the Hidden Leaf Village out of discomfort and simply because it was a tragedy that they would want to forget and without having something to represent their tragedy and something to remind them of that then they would be able to not focus all of their hatred in one area and the process of rebuilding could go over smoothly in the meantime naruto would be raised by tsunade along with her assistant shizune with the ambu member tenzo aka yamato soon being tasked with watching over young Naruto and his development. However, the four would grow into a family of their own and would adopt the name Senju. Tsunade Senju, of course, but with Shizune Senju and with Yamato Senju, along with Naruto taking the last name Senju in this timeline instead of Uzumaki. But now, our story begins with Naruto having returned to the Hidden Leaf Village for the first time since his birth as he is now assigned to a new Ginning team. With the Ginning teams now being reshaped and turned around, let's see how things shape up in this new timeline. Without further ado, let's get into today's video. As always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. For Naruto, he would take time adjusting to his new surroundings, trying to make do with being a part of a ninja team. Of course, this wasn't because Naruto was in any way bad at communication or anything along those lines. Unlike his canon counterpart, this version of Naruto was not inept. He had grown up in a small town far from the Hidden Leaf Village, yes, but there were still children in the area who he would play with from time to time and communicate and converse with also. So it wasn't like Naruto had no social skills. It was just that the two people he were paired with were, well, kind of odd in different ways. First, there was Shino Aburame. Shino was the quiet and reserved type. He mostly preferred just dealing with his bugs and his colony and just observing multiple insects in nature. That wasn't really too odd since even Naruto liked to look at bugs when he was younger, so he tried to bond with him over that. However, the person who was a bit more difficult to deal with was Ino Yamanaka. Now, Ino had nothing against Naruto personally. Remember, Naruto never grew up in the Hidden Leaf Village, so none of the children of this graduation class knew much, if not anything, about him. So there was no bad or ill will. It was just that for Ino, she wasn't really happy with the team she had been assigned to. She had wanted to be on the same team as Sasuke. Almost every girl in the Hidden Leaf did. But sadly, that fortune went to Hinata Hyuga. Now, you're probably wondering, why is Hinata crushing on Sasuke? Well, many of you were able to guess the reason as to why. It was because Sasuke had taken the place of Naruto in this timeline, with Sasuke being the one that saved Hinata from those bullies all these years ago. 
and it was because of this that Sasuke had earned the favor of Hinata in this regard. With that being said though, Hinata was still as shy as she had always been, so her trying to reach out to Sasuke was easier said than done. However, unlike many of Sasuke's other fangirls, Hinata wasn't the type of person who allowed her feelings for Sasuke to shroud her judgment. So she still applied herself in many ways, however it wasn't too uncommon for her to steal glances at Sasuke from time to time. However, unlike the others, she wasn't so open about it. However, Hinata, all the same, still had feelings towards the Uchiha boy. In the meantime though, Ino was not too thrilled. To have to be in a situation where she would no longer be able to see her precious Sasuke as often as she would have hoped. And now, she was stuck on a team with two other boys who, one, she found to be creepy, and the other one, who was kind of cute, she knew absolutely nothing about. Then finally, there was their Jonin sensei, Asuma Saratobi. Now, when it came to the overall Ginning teams, the reasons why they had been put together was a lot different than you might think. Why was there no Ino Shika Cho? Why was Naruto in the hands of Asuma instead of Kakashi? And how did Sakura get removed to another team? Well, there's actually a pretty simple explanation for that, and it's one that might surprise you. First, you have Team 7 led by Kakashi Hatake, the team making up of Shikamaru Nara, Sasuke Uchiha, and Hinata Hyuga. The reason for this team pairing is because the dynamic is actually a lot even in terms of personality and in terms of skill. If you notice in the original timeline, Shikamaru was on Team 10 with Asuma. However, it's made very apparent early on in the series that Shikamaru has a very sharp and analytical mind. This is actually displayed multiple times throughout the series of Naruto, from Shikamaru's fight against Tamari, to his fight against Tayuya in the Sasuke Retrieval arc, to how Shikamaru performs against Hidan and Kakazu during the Akatsuki Suppression arc, and even going forward into the events of the Naruto light novels and in the Boruto era. Shikamaru is a genius of his generation, but he's pretty lazy. And it doesn't help to have a sensei who is pretty much outwitted by his student and can't offer him much in terms of knowledge. However, putting Shikamaru on Team 7 actually puts him up against someone who can intellectually duel with him a bit. It means that while Shikamaru is smart, Kakashi can still get the better of him at times. This helps avoid the Shikamaru problem that you kind of see develop in Shippuden that's quickly rectified in the sense that Shikamaru is the kind of person who up until the time of Asuma's death would, could usually make a pretty solid plan that never failed. However, Kakashi is the type of person who can point out those failures rather quickly and also having the tactical mind from being one of the best of the Anbu Black Ops is definitely something that Shikamaru can take from. And he's not a bad sensei for boosting up Shikamaru's overall skills and improving him, making him more than just a tactical genius. As for Sasuke and Hinata, it's really self-explanatory. These are two shinobi who have access to powerful dojutsu. Sasuke being the last Uchiha, so Kakashi training him up with the Sharingan is a no-brainer. And while Hinata has the Byakugan, it can still mimic some of the abilities of the Sharingan, and in some regards, it's viewed as the superior dojutsu. I'm using quotations with that, since we know what comes later on in the series, but Hinata being in close proximity to Sasuke could lead to some developments that were never before seen in the Byakugan, but we're not going to go into any spoilers with that. Now, when it comes to Team 8, you're dealing with Sakura Haruno, who was the Konoichi of the year. In this timeline, that doesn't change either way. 
However, with Sakura being Kanoichi of the Year, it wouldn't really make much sense to partner her up with the Rookie of the Year for the boys. As such, Sakura was going to be placed in a special team of her own. When taking an aptitude test, the teachers were able to see that Sakura had a unique affinity for Genjutsu and Genjutsu related areas. As such, with that being taken into consideration, it was decided that Kurenai would work best as she could probably bring out Sakura's full potential, as while her academics and her basic knowledge of ninjutsu were superb, when it came to the physical department, she kind of struggled in that regard. However, this is where her teammates actually help her out. If Sakura is the genjutsu specialist, what does that make Choji and Kiba? Well, for Kiba, it's pretty obvious. He is the ninjutsu specialist. Granted, he only had a limited supply of ninjutsu in his arsenal, and you could say that the Inazuka clan's tracking and sensory abilities could prove useful for a genjutsu-led team, but he also isn't expertise when it comes to ninjutsu, as Kiba in this timeline actually came in second for Rookie of the Year behind Sasuke, with Sasuke having no one to challenge him, just like in the original. But now with no Naruto, it was just made even more apparent. As for Choji, he was the Taijutsu specialist, but he still had some areas that he could improve in personally. The idea for this team is for each member to try to help each other up, to boost them in the areas that they lack, with Koronai guiding them along the way, but she also takes some time out to show special interest in Sakura, similar to Kakashi's role with Sasuke. And then finally, you have Team 10, Asuma Saratobi, the leader, with Ino Yamanaka, Naruto Sinju, and Shino Abarame. Naruto being placed on this team actually makes a lot more sense because Naruto and Asuma have something in common. What is that? is that the two of them are sons of the Hokage. Granted, Naruto wouldn't be aware of this fact from the very beginning, but still, it was something that played a role in him being assigned to this team. Also, it's because of the fact that Naruto and Asuma are similar in many regards, that being in the fact that the both of them have the chakra affinity for wind, which is rare amongst shinobi who come from the land of fire, because fire is typically the element associated with most of the shinobi that come from this area. But then there's also Shino as well as Ino. What do they contribute to this team? Well, when it comes to Shino, he's actually a pretty all-around basic ninja. However, his use in the Abarame clan's insect jutsu definitely make him deadly. If Naruto is a close-range fighter, then Shino is a mid-range fighter. Ino with the Yamanaka clan's mind transfer jutsu makes her a long-range fighter. So this team's development comes basically from their ability to fight in different ranges. Naruto for close quarters combat, Shino for mid to long range combat, and Ino assisting from long distance as well as providing backup in any way that she can, with Asuma overseeing their training in that regard. But how were the teams doing in their first outings together? How were they developing? Well, to start with Team 7, Team 7 actually worked and shined a lot more than you might think they would. The reason being is that while Shikamaru definitely wants to improve, he has a lazy attitude. Because of this, he doesn't try to go out of his way to match up with Sasuke or outshine him. This means that Sasuke, even maybe to his own detriment, has no one that challenges his ego. Sasuke is the best on the team at least in terms of his physicality, and he knows this. While Sasuke is willing to acknowledge Shikamaru's mentality, as well as his intellect, he knows for a fact that Shikamaru is not someone that will try to challenge him in a physical sense, so Sasuke can keep his alpha mentality in that regard. Hinata, she's able to improve by her training with Sasuke and with Shikamaru. And while her power continues to grow, so too does her confidence with Kakashi guiding her and pushing her when need be. 
and for Shikamaru, he has someone who can challenge him more on an intellectual level, so he never feels like the smartest man in the room. Then next there was Team 8. Koronai, as I've explained earlier, would take a special interest in Sakura and in her development, her chakra control being as perfect as you could hope for someone wanting to study and learn Genjutsu. However, with the help of both Choji along with Kiba, they help Sakura improve in her areas when it comes to the likes of Ninjutsu and Taijutsu, with Kiba helping with the Ninjutsu and Choji helping with the Taijutsu to help improve in the areas that Sakura was lacking in. And because Sakura wasn't on in the same team as Sasuke, she has nothing to distract her from her training, allowing her to actually blossom and develop into the proper Konoichi she's meant to be. But then our story shifts to Team 10. They were having some growing pains and that was to be expected. The main reason, Naruto was so far ahead of the other two. It was pretty obvious. The boy's chakra control was subpar, better than anything that Asuma could have expected. Whenever they sparred, Naruto was always able to keep the upper hand against Shino, and to some degree, he had the physicality to match against Asuma. He definitely had the stamina and the power to outwork almost everyone. Then next there was Shino. Shino's problem was his stamina. The boy was good, but he had a tendency to rely on his insects a bit too much. Because of that, he wasn't the type of person who could go the distance, if you will. I think if there's a better analogy that I could give you for Naruto and for Shino's dynamic, I'm going to take a wrestling page here. Naruto is like Kenny Omega. What I mean by that is that Naruto is like the best bout machine. He can go 12 rounds, 24 rounds, 32 rounds, 50 rounds if need be without breaking a sweat. However, Shino, he's more like a Brock Lesnar. He's the type of person who tries to go in and finish the fight quickly because the more it continues, the more gassed he ends up becoming. So in that regard, it benefited Shino to train with Naruto to boost up his stamina, much needed. However, there was another issue, and that was Ino. Ino was content with her mind transfer jutsu. She was someone who was lacking in many areas, and it got to the point where one day Naruto had to call her out on it. After one day of training, when it came to an end and everyone was going home, Naruto would ask what she had been doing all this time. Sure, she participated somewhat, and the fact that Naruto was so advanced that Asuma decided to teach them tree climbing and water walking only showed just how far behind the both of them were. But compared to Shino, Ino was just light years behind. I don't have to answer to you, Naruto. I mean, no offense, but you're new here, so you don't know how things work. Yeah, that may be, but the way you performed, it just... And what's the problem with how I perform? I walked up the tree just like the rest of you, Ino would yell back at Naruto. Yeah, but you only went 8 feet off the ground. Shino and I have both been pushing towards 20 feet and we're trying to get higher. Well, I know I could go higher, but I'm trying to help out Shino. I want to help you too. Oh, why? You're hoping I'll go on a date with you or something? Well, I didn't ask for that. So what, I'm not good enough for you to go on a date with? No, I didn't mean that either. I mean, you're pretty cute, I'm not gonna lie. But the truth is, I just think you're wasting your talents. And just what would you know about talent? I get it, you're some mysterious boy who can do just about anything and everything. No wonder why Sensei loves you so much. Huh? It's pretty obvious. He's just impressed with you all the time. I mean, seriously, where the hell did you even come from? You're already this skilled for a guinea. You could easily be a tuning by now if you try hard enough. So why even bother being on a team? Well, 
I was told by mom that I was supposed to join a team eventually. It was supposed to teach teamwork and its importance. I mean, I used to think the same, but she quickly humbled me. But seriously, from what I heard, they said that Sakura won Konoichi of the Year. Yeah, so what about it? Well, no disrespect to her, but you're a lot better than her. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. I know I'm better than Billboard Brow. You don't have to remind me of my greatness. Then why weren't you Konoichi of the Year? There was a deathly silence behind that. Why wasn't she Konoichi of the Year? She had the skill. Heck, when her family learned about it, they chalked it up to it just being that that soccer girl must have been really skilled and definitely gave their baby girl a run for her money. But that wasn't the truth. The truth was, what has she been doing this whole time? All these years, she always knew she was better than Sakura. That much was certain. The girl only grew out her hair because she was trying to copy her and get Sasuke's attention. Heck, she was the one that had to defend her from bullies. And yet, she didn't get Kanochi of the Year. It didn't really dawn on her until that point, but she lost to Sakura. And now this boy, who was way better than them, acknowledged that she should have won it. Even over Hinata, but she lost to Sakura. Ino would bite her lip in anger, storming away from Naruto. Naruto tried to follow behind her, but Asuma advised against it. He knew a few things when it came to girls, and sometimes when you were on their bad side, it was best just to avoid making the situation worse. Although even he echoed Naruto's sentiment. Ino had so much potential, and yet felt like she was making it fall to the wayside. The next morning, Naruto would arrive to the training field first. He could hear someone in the distance. And then he heard a yell of pain. As he rushed over to see what it was, he saw Ino falling on her butt. Yelling out and crying as it seemed like the girl had been falling down a lot in the last hour. Ino? Naruto would ask. Naruto, what are you doing here? I just wanted to get an early start on training. I, um, I didn't expect you to be here. So what? I just wanted to come out here earlier. Can't a girl just try to practice in peace? Just go somewhere. You're working on your tree climbing, right? N yeah, so what? Do you want some help? N no? Are you sure? I mean, I don't think... Look, I don't need your help. I'll be fine. Ino would immediately rush up the tree, trying to go as fast as she could. On pure momentum, she had managed to get up to 15 feet. However, she lost her slipping and started to fall. She knew that from this height, it was going to hurt. However, the crash never came. Naruto quickly jumped up the tree trunk, grabbing her, holding her in his arms before flipping to the ground. The way he held her was almost like a prince holding a princess, and it caused her to turn bright red at this before quickly pushing off of Naruto, and that forced her to fall on her butt. Oh, oh, why did you drop me? What? You're the one that pushed me off. That's not the point. You're supposed to not let go. Um, okay. Um, you know, I think that you need to work on... Work on what? What is it? Uh, it's nothing. Uh, you look like you were doing pretty well, so I would just advise to keep focused. Naruto was preparing to walk off when Ino would yell out to him. Hey, um, uh, if, 
if you were going to teach me, how could I keep better focus? Naruto smiled as he walked back towards her. He caught a leaf that was falling in the air before holding it to her forehead. I want you to concentrate. Concentrate on what? Concentrate chakra to your forehead. Ino would start to do so. It was faint, but it was enough. The leaf was staying in place on her forehead. Naruto would let go and the leaf would stay. Good. Now I want you to hold that. Hold it for as long as you can. Ino tried to do so, only lasting two minutes before the leaf fell off. Mentally, she felt exhausted. Hmm. You feel drained, don't you? I do. I feel like... I feel like I'm gonna pass out. I feel like my brain's just been on overload. <laughs> That's the spiritual side. Spiritual side? Yeah. Come on, you know how chakra works. The combination of your physical and spiritual energies. That was a mental training. It's something I had to do. Believe it or not, when I was born, my chakra control was absolutely terrible. I couldn't even make it up the base of the tree without crashing my head, and that was only by going up three feet. Ow, sounds like it hurt. It did. My head's super hard to prove it. However, chakra control was something that had to be, well, beat into me. But it's not just from training. It comes from a want. You have to want it as much as you do the training. So what do you think? Well, I think you go through the basics just fine. But have you tried going beyond that? I think it's all about effort, you know? You can do so much more, but you just have to put in a bit more effort. If you do that, I know your training will show off tenfold. You can be and do so much better. And I'm sure you'll get his attention that way. Eno would turn even more bright red at this. Whose attention? <laughs> it's obvious you have a crush on the Uchiha. Sh shut up! So what if I do? What's it matter? You jealous? <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Well, stop. But you're right. I could afford to do better. From there, Eno's training would consist of her doing the leaf exercise in the morning. And in the afternoon, Naruto would help her with the physical. This involved running. Running a great distance. When it came to training, the boy could be a taskmaster of sorts. There were some days where Eno absolutely hated it. And then, right when their running was over and after a short break, they'd get right back to the leaf training. Eno felt like she was being worked overtime, coming home mentally and physically exhausted. However, her father noticed a change in his daughter. He could tell when someone was really training and when someone was just faking a funk, so to speak. The fact that his daughter came home sweaty, bruised, covered in grass stains, and he could feel the exhaustion just oozing off of her. He could sense it. He could even see the muscle slowly beginning to form around her, no longer looking so, well, soft or frail. Hmm. I wonder what's got her working this hard. But in either case, it's definitely doing my baby girl some good. After some time, Eno was able to run up the base of the tree, moving to around 30 to 40 feet, marking it with her kunai before flipping from branch to branch down to the ground. And she was excited. She didn't think that she could do anything like this before. She didn't even know she was capable of it. She felt fitter. She felt as light as air. She felt like she was mentally and physically more focused than she could ever imagine. And Naruto was happy to see that his teammate was catching up. Asuma was even happy to see the improvement by the Konoichi. 
and now he could finally push the team to the next level. That was wire walking. Although no surprise, Naruto knew that also. So he would help Asuma in bringing Shino and Ino up to speed. Shino, much to no one's surprise, was able to get the grasp of the technique fairly simply after some time. He and Naruto even sparring on the wire a bit. The two boys were definitely benefiting from hanging out together, and they even built up a good friendship. Naruto didn't view Shino as weird or anything like that, and unlike most of the times when people wouldn't acknowledge that Shino was there, Naruto was almost always the first one to acknowledge his presence, and it actually made the young Abarame boy feel happy. He didn't feel like an afterthought. Someone actually acknowledged when he was around. Ino, on the other hand, needed some work, and this is where Naruto had some fun. Well, if he was going to help her out with her wire walking, he might as well enjoy it. Ino would attempt wire walking on a lake. She was only barely able to do so. The main problem was that she didn't have concentration. And, well, this is where Naruto's not so chivalrous side came out. You see, just because Naruto was raised by Tsunade, it doesn't mean that his godfather didn't visit him from time to time, Jiraiya. And let's just say, the boy picked up some very, very bad habits. Habits that a mother would never want for her child. And one of these habits was developing a certain jutsu, a jutsu that if she ever caught Naruto using again, the boy was going to feel the full fury of the slug princess. That jutsu was the sexy jutsu. However, sexy jutsu wasn't going to work here. No, Ino needed something different. While Ino was standing on the lake, Naruto would create a shadow clone. The two clones would wave as he would use it. Ninja art, reverse sexy jutsu, Sasuke edition. Ino would be floored. What she saw was two shirtless, sweating, Sasuke, Sasuke Kun, and immediately she fell in the water. <laughs> you fell for it, Naruto. This involved a never-ending cycle of Naruto being chased all throughout the training grounds while Ino tried to beat him with every stick and every rock she could get her hands on. However, this did force her to have to maintain her focus, and Naruto did not make it easier. As the days went on, the clones increased, so did the number of sexy Sasuke's. Heck, Naruto had so much fun with it, he started making as many type of variant sexy Sasuke's as he could. Sexy schoolboy Sasuke? Sexy chef Sasuke? Or how about... Sexy mud wrestling Sasuke. Naruto's personal favorite. Reverse style. Sexy Yaoi Sasuke. That one definitely got under Ino's skin. And not in a good way. The water was covered in a lot of blood. But finally, after Naruto hit her with the barrage of sexy Sasuke's, the girl was standing on the water glaring at him menacingly it had worked the girl was able to concentrate she was able to stand and walk on the water like nothing bothered her she didn't need anyone to come out and save her from drowning however this also meant that there was nothing stopping her from chasing Naruto and Naruto quickly felt the ire of a woman as Ino picked up a rock and with pinpoint accuracy 
knocked the boy clean off his perch. The girl could definitely aim when she wanted to. All in all, Team 10's skills continued to grow. Until finally, after one month's time and doing a bunch of D ranks, Naruto was starting to get a bit antsy. Granted, they had been doing well, but he thought they could be doing more. While walking home one day, he would be stopped on his path. He looked up to see who it was. It was Sasuke. The real Sasuke. Uh, you're Sasuke, right? Naruto would ask. What do you want? I want to spar with you. With me? Yeah. I don't know who you are or where you came from. But you obviously have to have some power inside of you. Wait, power inside of me? Does he know about the... You're way too skilled to say otherwise. You must be really good. And I want to see just how good you truly are. So I want to spar with you. If you got the time. I see. He's just looking to test himself. Well, I just got back from training, so... No, no, Sasuke. There's no need to go picking fights so late in the evening. Our young Naruto here probably wants to go home and rest up. Oh, uh, hi. Um, Kakashi. Nice to meet you, Naruto. You, you know my name? We've heard about you, some of the higher-ups. They say you're pretty good. I can't wait to see what you're capable of down the road. Maybe you will battle against my Sasuke sometime. Sasuke would be a bit annoyed at this, but would learn to take the cue and would back off, Kakashi giving Naruto a warm eye smile as Naruto would bow respectfully before continuing on his way home. Kakashi would then look to Sasuke. Don't you think it's a bit early to start picking fights? I just wanted to see the power of the Sinju. Kakashi would be a bit worried. After all these years, he kind of had hoped that the rivalry between the Sinju and the Uchiha would have died. Although technically that boy wasn't a Sinju, the fact that he had the last name didn't really help the case. One day those two were going to clash. Who was going to come out of it the victor? No one would know. Eventually the time would come when both Team 10 and Team 7 would look to advance themselves. To take a mission that they could truly sink their teeth into. The third Hokage taken into consideration would have two missions available. It would involve traveling outside of the land of fire. One going to the south and one going to the north. Team 7 was going to be taking the southern mission. A mission that would lead them to a different area. Both missions were a bodyguard mission. One for a bridge builder and one for a princess. Now, you might be familiar with the first one, but the second one, maybe you know or maybe you don't. To begin, Team 7 was with given the mission of guarding a bridge builder named Tazuna. This was going to be the mission to the Land of Waves. However, for Team 10, they were going to be guarding a princess turned actress, and her homeland was the Land of Snow. Yes, the movie Ninja Clash in the Land of Snow is going to be canon in this universe because that mission goes to Team 10. Both teams would be given their missions at the same time, with Naruto's team heading to the north, while Sasuke and his team would head to the south, like in the original timeline. Now, I won't go into full details about how the missions turned out, since going back and forth would take a while. However, to give you an overall cliff notes of how the missions turned out, Team 7's mission to the Land of Waves would go about the same as in the original timeline, 
with them coming face to face with the likes of Zabuza, the Demon of the Mist, and just narrowly escaping with their lives. Now, Team 7 would still go through the tree climbing exercise, and all three were able to perform pretty well, and were able to develop their skills at an even faster pace. Because Shikamaru was a lot more perceptive and had a lot more of a higher intellect, he was able to stay on guard when Gato's thugs attacked Tazuna's house. Now, as far as Tazuna's grandson Inari and his relationship to the ninja, he would actually take more of a liking towards both Sasuke and Hinata, as the two of them could share their experience with the loss of a parent, with Sasuke the loss of his entire clan. Although Sasuke was definitely a lot more harsh, maybe even more to a degree than Naruto would have been in the original timeline, Hinata was there to comfort young Inari, to show him that deep down Sasuke did care, that was just his own way of expressing it. Although for Hinata, and for the little that she did know about Sasuke, she kind of wondered just how much the pain of losing his family weighed on him. As she had learned bits and pieces of the Uchiha massacre, she kind of wondered how he was dealing with it. She was truly concerned for the boy's well-being. Ultimately though, in the Battle of the Bridge, it's Hinata who takes the fatal strikes against Haku in order to protect Sasuke and to keep him safe. This causes Sasuke's angers to blaze, feeling like he had once again lost yet another teammate, and someone who he was actually close with. Because of this, Sasuke develops his two Tomoe Sharingan in both of his eyes, gaining the speed and strength advantage needed to overcome the ice user. Ultimately, the fight still ends similar to how it did in the original timeline, only Shikamaru would play a bigger role, assisting Kakashi in capturing Zabuza in the Shadow Possession Jutsu combined with the ninja hounds that bind it and held him in place. Because of this, Haku would still sacrifice his life for Zabuza, and it would still result in Zabuza dying after he kills Gato and his thugs on the bridge. However, Hinata does manage to recover and survive, and with that, Team 7 would make their way from the Land of Waves. However, the Great Naruto Bridge would be named the Bridge of Sasuke Uchiha, the Avenger. In the meantime, Naruto and Team 10 would have their mission in the Land of Snow, guarding the actress who is actually a princess of the Land of Snow and protecting her from her uncle, a assassin who was actually trying to kill her and her whole family in order to seize the throne. The climax of the battle resulting in Team 10 battling against the deranged uncle and his specially made armor that can absorb chakra. In the midst of the battle, Ino finds herself being hurt after trying to stall long enough to give Naruto the advantage. Seeing his teammate being injured in such a way, would cause Naruto's anger to blaze, and for the first time, the Nine Tails Chakra would be released. Just when the boy thought that he was out of all the chakra he could use, the Nine Tails would give him a much needed boost, as he delivers a chakra control concentrated Nine Tails infused punch to the center of the armor, its weak spot, causing it to break away and defeat the enemy. Ultimately, the assassins would be captured and arrested, and the princess would now resume her duties as a royal of the Land of Snow, but would still continue her dreams of being an actress, and would even give Naruto a special gift as a way of showing thanks, the gift being a special autograph, an autograph of her giving Naruto a kiss while he was unconscious in the hospital. While Asuma would give the boy congratulations, and Shino would be surprised by Naruto gaining some newfound fame, Ino would be the one that would be, dare I say, jealous, seeing how happy Naruto was with the photo and giving him a punch in the arm, walking back home to the Hidden Leaf, a bit angry for some time. By the time both teams had made it back to the Hidden Leaf Village, both senseis would give them a short reprieve, 
some time off to rest after the trials they had endured. Our scene would end with both Kakashi and Asuma arriving to the hot springs at the same time. The two senseis enjoying the sauna together as they would recall the rather extraordinary missions that they found themselves on. Man, you went through all that, Kakashi? Asuma would ask. You probably should have turned back when you had the chance. I could say the same for you. Yeah. The old man really needs to get his act together. How do simple bodyguard missions end up turning into life or death battles? It's the life we live, Asuma, Kakashi would say. It's the life we live. So, what are you going to do for the next two months? Well, we're definitely not taking any more trips outside the village like that. I'm going back to doing D ranks. At the very least, the next C rank we do should definitely have a decent background check. Oh, I agree. But I was actually asking about the tuning exams. Oh yeah, they are in just two months. The kids sure picked a fine time to graduate. How's Naruto? Kakashi would ask. He's doing well. He definitely is the spinning image of his father, I'll give him that. He's definitely been trained very well in his time away from the village. I find myself learning from him just as much. He kind of reminds me of myself. And you? The Uchiha. I could say he honestly reminds me of a younger me. But in a way, he kind of reminds me of Obito. Although, he wouldn't show it outright. I see. So about the tuning exams, you thinking about signing them up? I've been thinking about it. I think they have what it takes. And you? Naruto's definitely ready and Shino's not too far behind. Even Ino's making some good improvement. I think I will sign them up. You think Koronai's going to add her team to the mix? Who knows? We have a lot in our hands when it comes to these nine rookies. They're definitely a lot more skilled than many would give them credit. But do you think they can handle the grueling parts of the tuning exams? Well, we'll learn soon enough. If they truly have what it takes, then they'll make it through just fine. And if not, they'll be eaten alive. This concludes... Naruto The Last Senju. What if Tsunade adopted Naruto? Part 2. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video as we continue. ReZero Avatar Loss. What if Aang was in ReZero? Season 1, Part 6, the Season 1 Finale. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.